very much uh, for coming to the Center of Faculty Forum. Uh, the whole idea is that we have faculty from very different disciplines so that we learn from each other. So Manuel Vidal from the uh, Department of Environmental Science uh, is going to speak on not all green is good, plantation forest in a changing world. Okay, thank you Manuel. Well, thanks for pulling this together, Dorothy. Um, those of you who have any involvement with any one academic department know that trying to organize people is often akin to herding cats. Mm -hmm. And um, working across departments and across schools, um, I don't know, that's herding a whole family of felines. And so it's, this is a major effort to pull this sort of thing together. I really appreciate the time you put into it. This story. This is really great. Well, we, we can't do it without willing participants, so thank you. Um, <laughs> what I want to do today is talk to you about some work that I began in 2011 when I was um, a in the second round of people, this was occurring in 2010, uh, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, which they called um, their senior foreign scientists. And this was an effort to bring in non-Chinese scientists, mostly European and North American, to China um, for varying lengths of time. I was there for a year to both work on a research project and begin to bring our perspective on research and scholarship in our particular field in the areas that the Chinese government was really interested in. And I work on ecology and biodiversity and ecosystems and biogeochemistry. And this is an area that China, in the early 2000s, began to really focus on. And they realized that this was an area that they didn't have a lot of strength in. And so this began, and um, various other um, European scientists, Barry Slick, Chuck Kahn, people if you're in college, you know who these folks are, came for varying lengths of time. Um, and really, it began for me some really interesting conversations about what are the, the threats and the possibilities for countries in Southeast Asia in particular um, to develop their rainforests in ways that would be both economically viable and useful and, in some sense, sustainable both for the communities of the people there, and for the country, and for the environment. And those three elements turn out to be really important. Now, I had originally talked, when I started putting this together, um, I was going to talk about work in rubber plantations and in palm plantations. Because those are the two main forest plantation systems that in Asia are replacing natural forests, unmanaged forests different challenges in the New World Tropics. As I began to do this and talking with Dorothy about time and audience, I realized that I couldn't, it was too much. So I'm just going to talk about rubber today, um, which leaves out a lot of what the ecology and environmental community is most worried about, and um, probably rightly so. But I think in, the, in a sense, rubber is a nice one for this audience because rubber plantations we have a longer history of them in Asia. We can, we can actually understand more about their impacts, positive and negative. And in a sense, it's not as fraught as palm because of the clear disastrous effects that palm plantations are having. Um, so not all green is good, and not all plantations are bad. And that, you will hear, is sort of the, the dominant theme through this talk. Um, I don't see a pointer, so I'll use this as a pointer and it works for you as well. Here is a long distance view. Does that look like yeah. that? Yeah. Like that. Um, and it works even on the screen. Um, an aerial view of a rubber plantation in and close up view of, of rubber trees being tapped. Aerial view of a natural forest. Um, this is in Gunampala, in Indonesia, actually, um, where I began working in Asia a long time ago. And um, close up view of a secondary forest 
from an unmanaged system. And I want to stress to you two sides of thinking about the environment. And these are not, on the whole, these are ones the ecologists have so incorporated into our psyches that we don't always make these differences explicit. On the one side, there is what I'll call the biophysical and the biogeochemical side. That is the regulation uh, and the modulation of matter and energy movement. So carbon, temperature, water, all the way, all the different elements and forms of energy that move into and out of systems. And on the other hand, the other side is diversity. That is the variability in living things here. And these two, there's been a lot of argument since over oh, the mid, late 1980s about to what extent these two are linked positively or negatively, and to what extent they're orthogonal to one another. That is, can we maintain biophysical and biogeochemical rates and levels even if we lose biodiversity? And if we maintain biodiversity, are we going to still have the same bio biophysical and biogeochemical rates? And I'll talk to you today and make the argument that some rubber plantations have provided really strong evidence that, in fact, even though, by definition, going from a forest where you might have 1,200 species of trees in one square kilometer to one where you have literally one species in one square kilometer, biophysical processes and biogeochemical processes are maintained. And that's, that's, a, that's a fairly striking claim and one that is still somewhat controversial, but there's coming to be more and more evidence of it. So here's another picture. This one is actually Tim Lehman's picture um, looking down from one of the tall mountains at the, at the edge of Blooming Pollock Park. And what do we see about this intact forest here? Very high biomass levels, almost as high as anywhere found in the world in these, in these tropical wet forests. Okay, so that, from the perspective of someone who wants to think about sort of an ecosystem service term, is a lot of carbon stored in that system. Incredibly high levels of diversity. Just mind-bogglingly high. I'll show you some of our data on that in a moment. Simultaneously, in these systems, we tend to have very, very low levels of soil nutrients. Almost all the nutrients are packed in the living organisms in these systems. Now that turns out to be really important if we're going to transform these forests into a managed system. Because that means that when I plant my when I take out these trees and I plant my crop, I have very few nutrients in the soil for them. I might have a big pulse initially if I cut this and I burned it. The, the ash residue can contribute a lot of nutrients for a few years, but there's not much there. And in fact, and this would go into the weeds, so to speak, of the, of the soils, the soils don't have a lot of capacity for holding nutrients. So it's not, it's intrinsically not a good system for growing crops that have a very high nutrient demand. Now, where do we see what sorts of crops tend to have the lowest nutrient demand? Trees much lower nutrient demand than herbaceous species. So, first pass, from an ecological perspective, tree crops make sense. As I say, they're all perfect, but they make sense. That's what I mean when I say limited crop potential here. Let's see if I can advance this. Okay. The other thing that we see, and I actually do have one palm picture, is in, in here's a picture from Yunnan, rubber plantation, this is about a 10-year-old plantation, roughly. Um, intermediate biomass, very low diversity, very low nutrients, not a lot of fertilizer. Note also the physical structure in here. Okay, oops, this is the wrong button. Note that this is a very highly ordered system. Everything is in rows, the rows are parallel, and that has the potential 
to change energy and chemical and chemical transfers. Right? You have the change potential to change water flow, you have the potential to change energy exchange. It's an open question. It has to be investigated empirically. So here's some data on this diversity, and it's just mind-boggling what you see. Just for a few of the genera, and we're talking these systems will have three or four hundred genera per kilometer, and we see genera here with some of the very diverse ones, 45 different species, down to 10, some of, some of the few as one, but we end up across Southeast Asia, we're looking on the order of about 200 genera and about 12 to 1400 species per square kilometer. And we're taking that down to one when, when we have these forests. Now, the range of rubber in East Asia. Um, so know what's going on here. I'm going to actually ask you to bear this in mind and think about this when I go to the next slide, which is global. And there's, a, there's great historical tales here of how rubber, which is native to the New World, got to Africa and to Asia, all sorts of spy, secretive robbery, theft, murder, um, adultery. It's a really wonderful story. But this map shows the global range of rubber production color-coded um, by intensity. And what do we see? We see that in the, in the native range, the rubber production is intermediate. Only in Southeast Asia do we see very high levels of rubber production. And that's an ecological story in and of itself. The reason for that, um, except for the one ecologist in the room, I'll, I'll throw it open. Can anyone make a guess as to why rubber in its native range has a lower productivity than in Southeast Asia. Pests. Hmm? Pests. Pests, yes. So here in Brazil, there are things where rubber has been for probably on the order of about 8 to 12 million years. Um, many things have evolved to eat rubber. And it is in fact very difficult to grow in a plantation setting. In Asia, we're far away from the pests that eat the rubber, and so we can grow them at very high densities without seeing pest outbreaks. And in fact, that's what we're. So what you have here is climate and soils across the tropical region, similar enough to support rubber, and an absence of pests and pathogens. So things like fungi um, and bacterial pathogens are largely absent in Southeast Asia. And so we get these phenomenal amounts of productivity there. So let's go back to look at where, where it's grown. And you see that it's growing across lowland regions and up to the very edges of the first hill areas, but not into highlands. And this is largely a temperature phenomenon here. So rubber is limited by temperature on this northern border here, and largely by water on the southern border. So there is the potential, we don't not include, not looking at Indonesia and Malaysia, where, where there is more and more rubber, but growing rubber production. But note here, as temperatures rise, and they are rising in this part of the world, the range that rubber can be grown will probably expand northward. Now, I'm going to take a moment here and interject a little bit about why rubber because that's going to prove to be a really important part of the story of how to grow rubber in a sustainable manner when, when thinking about timescales of decades. Rubber comes from a tree. You saw the trees before. It is a, what is considered a moderately processed product. That is, what comes out of the tree is not useful. So. Take, for example, corn. What comes out of the corn plant is extremely useful. It can be eaten directly. Not always is. Often we can process it into a corn syrup or something. But it can be eaten directly. Rubber first must be dried and then processed. 
And then eventually a rubber product is formed. And it turns out that natural rubber has physical properties that make it ideal in two very distinct areas. One is in very fine production, so hospital use of rubber, rubber gloves, rubber tubing. These, these articles are higher quality when they're made with natural rubber. Making them from synthetic rubber is possible where it's a petroleum byproduct, but it's much more expensive than from the natural synthetic. The other one, oddly enough, and this is the single biggest use of rubber, is at the other end of the spectrum. What do you think that is? The, it's the biggest use of natural rubber. Soccer balls. <laughs> no, they're mostly, that little rubber bladder is not very big. No, tires. Oh, nice. Vehicle tires. Now, think about this picture and the rise of the demand for vehicle tires. Think about the rise of the automobile in Thailand, in Vietnam, in China. The demand for rubber has skyrocketed over the last 30 years and is projected to keep going up. So this creates not just a big market now, but an expanding market. And in the realm of agricultural commodities, the growth potential is paramount. So natural rubber is going to expand. There's nothing we're going to do, be able to do about it. We might not be happy as conservationists, but the demand for it will in continue to increase because the demand for tires will keep going up. Remember that, the demand for tires. So the people who make those tires are going to be really important. Now, where have I come into this? I want to give, go personal for a moment here before I come back to this. We've been really interested in asking questions about this notion of biophysical, geochemical processes and diversity. Diversity, we know, is a disaster. So the question is, how bad is it on the other end as well? And, oh, this is just some, a couple of figures showing the expansion of rubber. This is from uh, some of the areas that we've been working in in Yunnan. You can see over the last 20 years or so, just this incredible development of rubber plantations. And um, here's just some data where we've combined field data surveys. This is work I began on my, when I was in Jishwabana with satellite overflies, where we're looking very simple measurements, um, essentially just natural color reflectance from red, green, and blue parts of the spectrum. Can we distinguish rubber? from intact forest. And it turns out, when they're fully leafed out, a rubber plantation looks like a similar age natural forest. When the leaves are off or when the leaves are coming back on, we can start to distinguish them. And what we can get from this is, here's a map just showing forest, non-forest. Here is rubber with the little patches of natural forest indicated on there. And we can actually do this by age. So we can use satellite data now to distinguish rubber from natural forest, even when we don't know much about what's going on on the ground. That has set the stage for starting to actually measure the physical and chemical exchanges that are going on. Okay, I'm going to come back now to this question of benefits and costs. Well, we think, and we have pretty good evidence for, that when rubber is grown appropriately and properly, we can maintain the biophysics and the biogeochemistry, and it offers really great employment opportunities. Rubber is harvested by hand. It, it has a very high employment level. That is, there's a high intensity, roughly one person per hectare for harvesting rubber right now. That, and that's unlikely to change. Um, we don't see mechanization of rubber harvesting in the near future at least. The challenge is, you do lose the biodiversity, there's this risk of pollution, and this is an area where actually China has been um, really at the forefront of experimenting with different growth methods and developing 
rubber plantation methods that minimize pollution and sort of biogeochemical disruption. And of course, like any commodity, there's the risk that there'll be a replacement. So, you know, what happened to copper as a commodity? It crashed as fiber probes came in and fiber optics to replace copper to copper lines. We don't see that happening in rubber. We don't see a, a synthetic alternative, and we don't see a decrease in demand in the near future, but it's possible. So here are the challenges and opportunities. The biodiversity challenge, I won't get into now because I'm running out of time. I'm going to get knocked off stage in a moment, I can tell. But I do want to talk a little bit about employment and social opportunities. I want to come back to that notion that I introduced before, that there is a dominant, we call it ecology, a dominant sink, a dominant consumer of that rubber. And those are the tire companies. And that's a leverage point, because these are big international companies who really care about two things, profit and profit. But the smart ones, and the rubber companies I'll show you are actually pretty smart, understand that if they're looking at the long term, they have to grow, they have to have their, maintain their source of rubber, and they need to maintain their image. Because the rubber market is not a monopoly. People have choices. And people's choices in tires are often not that tightly tied to price. They're tied to reputation. So reputation becomes re really important for these companies. And um, that's what I mean by talking about demand and international demand. So these rubber companies have, outside, for a natural commodity, a few companies in China and internationally have outsized influence on how this crop is produced. Very few crops have such a unitary, or not unitary, but oligopoly of consumers. They tend to be much more diffuse, which gives each consumer much less power. And these are the two big players in the field. Um, in case you don't have small children, that is not the Pillsbury Doughboy, that is the Michelin Man. And this is Pirelli, the two big players on the international tire market. And Michelin was first to realize this, and Pirelli has come on strong since, that growing rubber sustainably is both a smart investment on their part, because it keeps their supply chain intact, and it gives them great opportunity to improve their public image. And over the last five years in particular, Pirelli has just done a phenomenal job of encouraging sustainable rubber production, minimal fertilizer, minimal pesticide inputs, maximal soil retention from, from their producers. And they are really working hard to try and maintain their supply chain and make sure we know about it. Right Here's the home page of Pirelli. Right up at the top is sustainability. Their vice president for sustainability is one of the top vice presidents in the company. And um, I'm very happy to say, as of a few weeks ago, they are now interested, they feel that they now have a stable enough position as this to start reaching out to academics and essentially offering up what they've been doing as a source for research activities. So using Pirelli efforts to promote sustainability as a locus for research, both from the natural science perspective and the social science perspective. And that's um, tomorrow, I get to meet with the, the Vice President for Sustainability for Pirelli and see about how, if we can bring some of this activity to UVA. And with that, I will stop. Thank uh, you. Thank you. I'd like to start with one. Sure. Uh, as many tires are produced, there are as many used tires that need to be recycled. So how are they? How are they? So this is one, this is an area where um, the tire companies have realized they have, they have a real opportunity. Yeah. And they're modeling themselves, interestingly enough, on the aluminum companies. 
right? So this is what this is what has made aluminum affordable, where it used to be fairly it used to be expensive because you had to smelt it, and smelting aluminum is very pricey. It is cheaper, and it's, it's the difference is not as great, but recycling is becoming technologically feasible. It hadn't been technologically, 25 years ago it was not technologically feasible to recycle tires affordably. It's getting better, and the tire companies are pushing this. As long as they control that technology, they're very happy for it. They don't care. You know, this is just a new supply chain for them. It's tough, and it has been tough to, you know, the, one of the real challenges in any recycling program is to flow from the source, that is the individual consumer, back to the centralized recycling location. This is one of the big inefficiencies in all recycling programs. And it's right now a big problem with tires, right? Look around Albemarle County, how many recycling centers within 200 miles of, within 150 miles of here do tires? So it's, people are working on it. It's prob I would bet when I come back and give this talk again in 25 years, there will be tire recycling at the Ivy, at the Ivy recycling plant. It's not there yet, though. But the, I mean, in terms of the expansion of rubber, new rubber production, it'll be a while before that slows it down. The questions? Um, you, you spoke about the uh, biodiversity thing from the point of view of vegetation. But what about animals and birds and humans? So one of the great things about biodiversity is that if you get any one group right, you tend to get the others right too. That is biodiversity scales. So where you have diverse groups of plants, they are associated with diverse groups of insects. They tend to be associated with diverse groups of birds. That falls down at the very top of the apex of predators. You, know, you may have shot out leopards from your forest. You may not have rhinos left. But in those levels below, if you can maintain plant diversity, you tend to also get insect diversity. Yeah, but you don't maintain plant diversity with the rubber plantation. So what no, no, that's my point. Yeah. That's my point is that that diversity you, with the rubber plantation, you lose the plant diversity, and along with it, everything else. Oh no, we crack all. I didn't talk about how what the numbers look like for insect or bird diversity. You walk through a rubber plantation, it is almost silent. It is eerie how quiet it is in a rubber plantation. That's because there are no birds. And you go, you know, two kilometers away to an intact forest, it's a cacophony of birds and insects. And no, I mean, this is, it is a biodiversity crisis. I would argue that the way to tackle that is not to try to improve the biodiversity within the rubber plantation. I think that's probably a losing battle. It's a research question, but I think it's probably, my prediction is that it won't work very well. And in fact, the, spending that energy on intensifying rubber production within the plantation and preserving areas from plantation development is going to do more on the scale of tens to hundreds of kilometers for diversity than will trying to have intermediate levels of diversity within the rubber plantation. So I think rubber is, to, to draw an analogy to another tree crop, rubber might be fundamentally different from coffee in that respect where you can still get very high levels of coffee production with biodiversity management within it. I don't think that's going to be work. I don't think it's going to work with rubber. We have one more question, please. Yeah. Um, so, uh, first question is about if this uh, seems that biodiversity is hardened in the tendon in the rubber industry. So, do you know from the industry perspective, like they use the term sustainability, any idea how they interpret or define the term sustainability? <laughs> and the, my second question, could you please comment? I know China is the largest tire manufacturer, you know, and they, they grow this. So, but I have the impression US China trade war issue, rubber is one of the targets. So the tax that they're putting in, in, in China side, so importing rubber tire. So, what does that kind of 
change this uh, kind of a production supply chain? Um, so first question of how 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 define sustainability? I think that I'll be curious. I'll, I'll find out that more about that tomorrow. I don't I don't have a good answer to that based on what they talk about when they talk about their activities. They're mostly think they're mostly going in two on on two tracks. One is the recycling of already processed rubber, and other is sourcing their, their new rubber from environmentally aware production sites. Those are the two things that they're talking about with sustainability. I have not heard a lot of talk, and maybe it's because I haven't been listening for it, on manufacturing methods, for example. Not something I've, but I've, not, I've also not pursued that. And um, the second question of how will trade war with China affect things. <sighs> I, I am not sure, I don't know the numbers for how many, what proportion of U.S. tires are sourced from Chinese rubber. So China is importing rubber right now and producing tires and exporting tires. And what will happen if that export market disappears? Will the international, the non-Chinese companies be able to take up that slack? I imagine they're drooling at the thought of being able to do it. Um, that will, you know, what will China do with that? Your guess is probably better than mine. Um, I think, I mean, in terms of how this affects land use and development, of rubber plantation, we're taught these are these are models working on five, 10, 15 year scales. I get the feeling that the administration's trade policy is working on kind of a twenty to thirty minute scale. The uh, uh, what I'm going to present is the uh, world premiere of a work in progress uh, that. Uh, I guess I should call it a global premiere uh, of something that uh, is going to be a long essay or a short book. It's right now I've finished the draft to the last chapter. I have one more chapter to do. And the subject is something that's, that's grown out of uh, my experience as a social scientist and my experience as an expert on China and my research over the last 10 years about changes in the world political economy. And uh, this has led to a project with two distinct but related themes. The first thing is that social science is itself social, and that this is lost in many social science methodological studies. Social science is not the natural science of society. It's a social science itself, and therefore its basic methodology needs to recognize that the scientists, the research audience, and the subject of study are interactive. Uh, the basic task is not to predict outcomes, but to understand intentional action and its parameters, and how we as intentional actors and scientists interact. So that's the first thing, the, the social science. What, what basic reorientation does it require to consider social science as interactive between, uh, uh, between the researcher, the subject of study, not the object of study, and the audience as also a, a, a subject? And the second thing I want to emphasize is that social science today should adjust to a new era. That it's more than just globalization that's involved in this new era. I call it global social science, but it's not just the connectivity of uh, globalization that's involved in this new era. Basically, we are now entering an era of increasing convergence of life chances. By life chances, I mean uh, education, longevity, uh, uh, productivity per person, mobility, these things are becoming more, com 
more converging between developing and developed countries. You might think, well, of course. No, not of course. The previous 500 years was a period premised on divergence. So what's happening now is a big change. So social science, to adjust to this, social, the, the, the society in the grandest mode that we exist in is a society uh, that is moving in this direction. And we need to rethink what our social, what the, the sociality of social science is in this type of context. So social science should no longer see itself as parenthesis Western social science looking at the world, but rather as global social science of which the West is a part. And if you think that's the way it's looked at now, you must be in a different discipline than political mm -hmm. science. Because where I live, that's a problem. So well, this is pretty heavy stuff for a Friday afternoon. So I'll try to be merciful. I mean, my 20 minutes may seem long. I, I could already imagine that Dorothy's going to be checking her watch every 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, but if this does sound interesting to you, uh, please email me at the email up there, and I'll be happy to send you a brief description of the, of the book project and also the preface and introduction. And if you're still interested, which is quite unlikely, of course, uh, then when I finish the final, when I finally get the rough draft, I'll be happy to send it to you. Because essentially, I mean, I'm talking about social sciences. And I'm only a political scientist who studies China and Vietnam and a few other things, but not much. Uh, I need to crowdsource. You know, I need the criticisms. I need the comments from other disciplines, from other perspectives. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Now, so let's go to part one. Social science is social. That's my first point. And I'd say that we generally, social science, but particularly economics and political science, have a methodological guilt complex about being soft science. Okay, so because we're soft science, we want heavy methodology to chase smaller and smaller realities. And uh, I think that this type of, uh, to, to use a, a, a term from anthropology, disciplinary involution, where more and more people are doing less and less for everyone else is a real problem in social science. I don't think it's restricted to social science. I think that's a natural tendency in any discipline. Uh, and the problem here is that if we try to pursue laws and replicability and predictability as the, as the main purpose of social sciences, uh, we are forgetting that people are not billiard balls. They are intentional actors. And that intentionality of their actors, and our intentionality, and our sociality as researchers, and our audience, these things have to be fundamental to what? To the appropriate mode of study of society. So that's what we need to do. There's a difference between data collection and understanding. Imagine an alien at a football game. An alien comes down to the spaceship, he's not noticed, but there is a football game, and he tries to figure out what's going on. He can collect all the data he wants, he'll never have a chance, because he, you have to understand what's going on. Now, if, if we went to a cricket game or a rugby match for the first time and didn't know anything, we'd start being able to figure out some things because of the premise that we were humans and we knew games and, and, and we could figure out the rules. It wouldn't just be the regularities of what we observed. It would be the commonalities of what we were observing that would be important to our understanding, or important to our misunderstanding in the cases where we assume too much. Okay. So, uh, I mean, I'm sure all of us have had experience if you ever lasted through a cricket game or tried to figure out what was going on in the rugby game. Uh, and these things can have consequences. Or not. <laughs> oh. 
an example of misunderstanding in the other direction. A natural cross species mistake. Okay, so that's if our understanding is socially conditioned, then uh, this may seem to be not so much a problem. This is just one of my favorite cartoons. Uh, it's also in the book. Uh, if, if we're social scientists studying our own society for our own for a domestic audience, then it may seem to be not a problem. Okay, uh, because there are we all three would share the same general horizons of plausibility. If you made an argument that you know from your data, you made an argument that just didn't fit. Everybody would know that it didn't fit. And if you're making an argument that's strongly counterintuitive about what everybody thinks, it better be strongly demonstrated. Okay. So that's nice. But the natural tendency is, especially in the United States, to, uh, to assume that if something is true for one's own society, to one's own audience, to oneself, then it's universally demonstrated. There's a, a tendency, I think, especially strong in the United States because we are the, the apex, the apex social science predators. Uh, that that uh, that if it's true here, it must be true everywhere. It's sort of like, you know, social science is is American social science is the World Series of social science. Uh, whoever wins here has won, you know, basically. So you have that type of a, of a problem. But if intentionality matters, how do we understand other societies? And this gets to something that, that all of us are familiar with. Uh, and I would say, for starters, that comparative social science isn't about multiples. Comparative social science is not simply studying more than one country. Comparative social science should be about studying a different Comparative social science, and, and especially those of us who study China and maybe not so much other places, we know that studying China, at least from the United States, is, is comparative, you know, is different from studying the United States for an American audience. So how do we deal with that? Uh, this, and I'd say the answer is with difficulty. And the most difficult part is communicating our understanding to a domestic audience. So I would like to suggest a metaphor for this. Let's see if my computer will collaborate. Well, this is no <laughs> issue. This was, I should have had that up. But here's the picture for the metaphor, because you can't have a metaphor without a picture. Now I'm thinking, imagine a village at night, you know, and everybody is sitting in their own village, in their own house, with their lights on, and they can't see much out the windows, but they know there's neighbors out there. And, where their ideas of their neighbors are, well, first of all, the neighbors aren't as well lit as we are, and they're obviously not as intelligent as we are, and they'd be here, you know, and, and uh, but they're exotic, and maybe they're, maybe we're at risk to them, or whatever. So you have the formation of a phenomenology on the inside of what the outside would be like. But let's imagine that there's three adventurers that go out. And the first adventure goes out, and, and she goes out and and uh, and finds that boy, it is dark out here, you know. And you know all those all those exotic imaginings say it is exotic out here. And she goes back and she says, you know, you were absolutely right. It's exotic out there. It's very different. You know, she confirms the phenomenon experience. The second adventure goes out, and she goes to one house and then another house, and another house. She's these houses are a lot alike. And she comes back and she says, you know, uh, it's really, you know, basically the world is pretty much like here. You know, it's just, uh, it's just that they, you know, they wake up in the morning, go to sleep at night, they do everything we do, only they do it at their house instead of our house. Uh, so that's the second adventure. Now, people are going to listen to the first one because of confirming the phenomenology. The second was uninteresting. Okay. Uh, but, you know, it was okay, so that might be real. 
The third one goes out and actually goes into another house and, you know, I don't know, serves as an au pair, does something, stays there, learns the culture of that particular house, and then a year later she comes back after everybody's forgotten she left. Uh, and she says, you know, it's, there are very different houses out there, but you can understand them, and let me tell you about it. Uh, now that, her problem will not have been learning about the other house. Her problem will be talking to people when she got home. Okay. And if this sounds like Plato's cave, it is exactly Plato's cave, applied to comparative to social science. Uh, so that problem of the phenomenology of the, of the other society versus its reality, and that phenomenology itself has a certain reality. Uh, it's a, it's to bring it up to the snappy present, this is the Thucydides trap of uh, you know the China threat in the United States. So the truths of social science are particular; they're not arbitrary. Uh, they're not subjective, but they are intersubjective, and they're social condition themselves. Thus, this scientist is telling this audience that about that society. And the truths can be generalized if the social conditions of all three are more general. But it has to be done carefully because it's not a movement towards some higher truth of law. It's a generalization where the reality remains on the ground. And the question is, what, is, what, are, the, what are the similarities and dissimilarities? What, and you're not going higher, you're digging a bit deeper perhaps in coming up with the generalities. And that leads to the second thing. And the second thing is times are changing. Because the, the linkage there is that the world in which social science exists has been, had, was created as part of a modern Western world that was based on the divergence of society and the, the uh, divergence of life chances and the domination of the rest by the West uh, and you, the, the characteristics of this, the values of this, the values of, of property, the values of power, the values of, fu of, pro of uh, future, of progress, these values are intimately tied with the nature of social science as it exists. But that is changing. In 2008, you had the global financial crisis, and that was a big change in, in for, for me anyway, uh, and the idea that hege hegemony continued to be possible because the center of the system had problems. And then something that I found out very recently is that also in 2008, and totally unremarked at the time, and in fact I did the calculation from the IMF statistics to come up with this, 2008 was the first year that developing GDP passed developed country GDP since the 19th century. Uh, and so you think, well, developing countries, you know, this is convergence, okay? Uh, not passive, but convergence. Uh, this is a big change. Oh, I should say, so of course China is the secret player, right? So. I took China out of the data, and uh, without China, developing countries passed developed countries in 2018. So China made 10 years difference. It, it is not the whole phenomenon. It is a major part, but only a 10 year. It's not the trend. Okay, so how does this differ? Well, in this is uh, shares of global gross domestic product as estimated by uh, the source of all such estimates, I think it's Madison. Uh, and in 1700, the West was a third of the world production. In 1820, still a third of the world production. So that whole development of Western power, Westernization, Westernized, Western driven modernization here is done from the compactness and motivation of Western expansion, not simply from an aggregate uh, domination. But then, once established, look, you have a flip. You have some, almost 
of, of, of <coughs> global production in 1952 being West, 30% being the rest. Okay. And 78, pretty much the same thing. Two thirds West, one third rest. By 2003, things are changing a fair amount, and uh, Madison estimates that in 2030, it will have reflipped back to this pattern. Are you ready for that? Is your thinking about social sciences and society in general and global social science ready for that? If it is, great. More power to you. Because that's where it's going. Okay? So, what does this mean? Well, here's from 1980 on, here's, here's what's happening according to, and these are IMF statistics and projections, uh, where the 100% the bar is crossed in 2008 and then 170% predicted for the, for the early uh, 20s. <coughs> now this is GDP, I'll go into what purchasing power parity means, but basically it's an estimate of material production rather than currency values. Uh, and you have this, that is a change in estimator. Uh, that, however, is serious development of developing country uh, production. If we look at, at per capita GDP, much different picture, still rising, 15% in 1980, 27% in 2023, but that line, how long is that line going to take to cross that 100%? We won't see it. Uh, so, uh, what we have here, given the population... So is without China. Oh, oh, this is with China. <coughs> They begin to resent it. When I think of it. So anyway, uh, so what we have here is this being a, a demographic power, a power based in part on the increase in per capita productivity, but really that empowering a population difference between developing and developed countries. So we have demographic power versus the power of wealth. <coughs> and this isn't a decline of the West, it's just a lower growth rate, both in population and in productivity. So this is a major change, okay? And so if uh, I were if I were showing this in the Bush administration, I, I, in the, in the uh, Trump administration, I think it was like, ah, the Chinese are taking over. <coughs> is that the case? No, this is basically a fundamental change that's much deeper than just a change of partners. China's not emerging as a new hegemon. China's emerging as part of this general phenomenon of globalization. Globalization which reduces the salience of the West's domination that existed before and actually reduces the capacity for that. So what happens is that not that power doesn't matter anymore. Power certainly matters. But it doesn't, it doesn't determine as much as it used to. It used to be a question of victory, therefore domination. Now it's a question of pushing and shoving and then uh, deals and then continuing relationships within this pattern of unequal pressure. And that's what I call multinodal world rather than either a multipolar world or a unipolar world. Because polls suggest that there's one, there's some sort of definable group that if you got them, their, either their cooperation or their struggles will define the whole system. No, it's much more complicated than that. Uh, and so multinodal is, the, uh, think of nodes of attention, like nodes on computer hits too. Uh, and a whole web of these nodes. And it's, it's, you know, you get more attention if people are more at risk to you. They're more, they're more exposed to the relationship than you are. Well, that's the basic multinodal pattern. Uh, but it, at an even deeper level, 
those values that I mentioned of property, power, and progress upon which the modern world was built are fading. They never meant the same in the rest as they did for the West, for starters. And now that whole pattern of assuming the, the West as the dominant center is changing. And they will mean even less in a more globalized world. So for global social science, the, uh, for global social science, the change of eras implies the particularity of each community deserves respect because social science should remain social. But at the same time, the convergence of life chances and greater connectivity open up possibilities for general social science and collaboration. The West can remain a center of innovation only if it can make the difficult adjustment from habits of dominance to collaboration. Another one of my favorite cartoons, <laughs> and I'm sure everyone feels this way now. And, but keep on thinking. Questions for uh, Bradley? <laughs> I, I couldn't help thinking that, that your end is a pleading for what you hope rather than necessarily a description of what might go on. Oh, for sure. And I would see that the current American administration is uh, thinking backwards. Yeah, but you know, I think that structure makes a difference, and I think that one of the the, the social responsibilities of social science is to be as aware as possible of, of what possibilities exist, what and critique of of weaknesses in current systems, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I, I uh, uh, and also at the emergence in other countries of, of uh, uh, the Chinese model of international relations or the, the Danish model or whatever, I, mean, I know my field best, you know, those things are very important where they are. They're less important in the United States because we control the big journals. You know, we have to, you know, we control the major methodologies, et cetera. But I think that that will grow and should grow because China's problems, China's social science type problems are not solved by American solutions. You know, they have to be adjusted. They have to be addressed, you know, autonomously. So in the 1970s, um, biology went through a kind of a a method and direction crisis of what should we what should we do to do our field properly? Yeah, and there was there was I mean vicious vicious fights and arguments and the the stories of one professor walking into another one's office and measuring out because he was planning to evict the guy in three years and after he had been elected to the National Academy and boot him out. I mean, this this was went on at many universities, and eventually it settled down because, at least in in the natural science, there was a way to tell whether or not someone was successful. Right? Were they discovering things that led to testable predictions and further advances? We really could we really know we know what we know more now than we did in 1978, 1979. And we know why, because we pursued certain tracks and not others. And do you think that it is as easy to distinguish success from failure in the social sciences? And no. I'm thinking of economics where you know, you've got people pushing, arguing in academic journals for models that are clear failures, and yet they're in the top journals, and yet they have positions at R1 University. Yeah. So how are you going to do this if you can't even tell success from failure in your field? That is a real problem. But I, I think that the solution has to be in terms of the salience of the research for society's problems. That's why I think particular research, I think Chinese social science will have to be the primary uh, source of, of, of valuable ideas for Chinese society. 
Um, and the West can relate to that. It, it, they can be generalized. And the, the experience of other countries is important. But I think that, you know, uh, that basically uh, the particularity of society sets up a very different pattern from at least a sort of Newtonian model of, uh, you know, uh, scientists uh, dealing at will with, with the lab rats. And the lab rats can't read the paper, and uh, the lab rats can't conspire against the researcher. And, and they're not, the lab rats don't hire the researcher. So, so you're also sort of arguing against the globalization. In that, it, I'm not against globalization, but against the presumptive universalization of social science. Generalization, yes. Universalization, uh, no. I have a question. Uh, so, Brenda, I do hear more because uh, you so uh, you used it this China US and this but but my understanding but you with the contemporary issue is um, this notion of China and US is by itself is also changing the identity. Oh yeah. Right. So it seems that like um, a lot of it uh, so called China is um, it's it's not the, the, the mental image I have is not just we have a China, we have US and now previously it's this big and now we have to add them into it seems that the, 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 the identity of China, U.S. Is, is changing and a lot of a really vague boundary, you know, between these, uh, the, the, between the uh, transnational activities. So, for example, the, the firms, uh, 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 do you think Alibaba is a Chinese firm? Obviously, it's actually international because they have a stock market all over the place and stakeholder all over the place. So, and governance as well. So, I would, my question for you is yes, we want to kind of socializing this social science, but it seems there's a, uh, we need to redefine, the, you know, what, what, is, what, what does Chinese history or Chinese sociology that, what does that mean? It seems that also at the epistemological level that um, this, and, the, and also at the theoretical level. That this, so I, I, this is really, really complicated questions that I like to hear. You. <laughs> well, I hope you're not expecting an answer. No, just okay, keep on thinking. So okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> keep on thinking is, would be my answer. That basically, uh, uh, I don't think social, Chinese social science, from my experience with it, has China figured out. It's just that uh, the in what you're talking about, uh, the places I understand it from especially a political science point of view, uh, what's happening in American images of China isn't driven by so much by Chinese reality, but has a, a growing awareness that China is getting big and what is the type of threat. You know, this gets much more back to the phenomenology of, of, the, uh, of the other's reality than, than anything else, which itself is certainly worthy of study. It's, uh, Sam Huntington and his class of civilizations is easily proven wrong, but he's really hard to root out. I mean, there's a reality, a sort of, of existential reality uh, that 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 is a mentality, and that is a, a mentality that's that's viscerally attractive to a lot of worried Americans facing the others. <laughs> the outside. If I may, I'd like to ask the last question. Okay, sure. Um, from the methodological perspective, uh, we know China also has the Academy of Social Science, which sure. is very prestigious. Can you contrast a little bit how social sciences is practiced in China as in the U.S.? Uh -huh. The methodologies. I mean, how, are they similar or are they, uh, how are they different? I would say that there's a, a fair more similarity than one would imagine. Uh, on the outside, because there's a lot of there's a lot of copying, of not just of, of uh, I mean a lot of, of transfer. You know, to, to be if you're going to be a a public opinion poll person in Shanghai, you want to use the latest public opinion poll techniques, and those are techniques of the West in general, when the United States you have that type of influence, and you also have deeper influences than that. The uh, proliferation of think tanks in China, as well as university 
many also so, are Western trained too. Right? Many are Western trained, yeah. and, and so that are more. The, the many, some of my friends in Chinese social science are, are more and uncritically enamored of Western social science than I am. <laughs> am I more Chinese than they are? I don't think so. Okay. All right. But yeah. well, we'll have more conversation afterwards. Now sure. let's uh, welcome our third. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank very much treasure this opportunity to share and discuss my work with you. Um, my talk today is grounded in two lines of investigation, both of which strongly inform my uh, current research and teaching. Um, one is focused on urban morphology, morphology and spatial typology, uh, looking specifically at hybrid forms produced by the intersection of pedestrian infrastructure and architecture. The second line of investigation uh, is more focused on the experiential qualities of, of space in Hong Kong. Um, the title of my talk uh, today is Hong Kong Corporeal City. The car, with its irresistible features as a device of advanced technology, driver of economy, and symbol of societal status, has fundamentally shaped visions and realizations of cities throughout the 20th century and to this very day. The fascination for the car influenced many architects in their ideas for the future of cities throughout the 20th century. Le Corbusier's uh, urban visions, besides providing um, ample air and light to the city, included um, uh, uh, space for the free and un unobstructed flow of cars that also allowed for the clear separation of functions of living, working and leisure. Uh, in different zones of the city. Oops. Uh, Frank Lloyd, Lloyd Wright, proposition of Broad Acre City presents the diametral opposite to the Corbusier's ideas in terms of typology, a dispersal of individual units in the vast agricultural grid. Um, um, what it Oops. What it has in common is that the system is held together by novel technologies, from new forms of communication to car mobility. Frank Lloyd Wright even designed his own cars for this new form of city that he envisioned. The realization of the American dream exemplified in the housing schemes of Levittown share many values and spatial solutions with Wright's proposition. These new suburban typologies created for returning World War II veterans and their families took full advantage of the car and allowing for flexibility, individuality, a radical expansion of settlement area, and the provision of affordable homes for a larger number of people. Implied in this effort is the elimination of the necessity of functional walking. Uh, possibly as a kind of labor that needs to be overcome in the process of becoming part of the middle class. The activity of walking then returns in the form of performative walking, either on a treadmill to maintain fitness, or as seen here on the Charlottesville downtown mall, as a leisure activity that is strolling along shops and restaurants out of pleasure, not by necessity, and only after accessing the pedestrianized area by car. Los Angeles is the epitome of a car-based city as a low-rise sprawling carpet that is almost exclusively accessed by personal vehicles. Producing its own iconic typologies that provide for the access of cars to buildings in the form of parking lots, drive-ins and drive-throughs. Single-story buildings lined up along roads are optimal for car access. The window ledge next to the driver's seats forms a new datum in the city. The car-based approach is prevalent in the making of U.S. City, cities, but it is also present in European urban and suburban development from the 1950s onwards, and highly influential in more recent urban expansions and city-making in China. Here, for example, a view of Shannon Boulevard in Shenzhen, uh, and here a view of the Third Ring Road in Beijing, whose iconic bike culture got eradicated within the decade into its modernization and expansion process. Richard Sennett in Flesh and Stone argues 
that the speed and dispersal that comes along with motorized movement leads to a loss of sense of the tactile reality and to space turning into purely a function of movement containing the least possible distractions. As a result, he states that by moving through standardized environments optimized for car travel, drivers need to pay only minimal consideration to people and buildings in the context that they are traversing. Hong Kong presents a different kind of model. There are cars and substantial urban road networks in Hong Kong. However, I would like to suggest that Hong Kong has maintained and further developed a different kind of intelligence, even if by accident or necessity rather than by conscious choice, by creating a city that responds to the needs of the walking human body. Hong Kong is a predominantly pedestrian city with only about 6% of uh, car trips uh, uh, by private vehicles. Uh, judging by its first appearance, Hong Kong may not be an obvious place to trigger associations with pedestrianism, body-city relationship, or the notion of human scale in general. Human scale is often associated with low-rise streetscapes, as exemplified by historically grown European cities. I would like to argue that human scale, at least from an experiential perspective, is not as much defined by the overall size of buildings and structures, but by the grain within those structures and the multiplicity and density of programs and access points to them for walking humans. Hong Kong does not only conform with the principles of small scale, mixed use and short distances of a model pedestrian city uh, that are characteristic of European city centers, it developed a new type of pedestrian city altogether, with increased density, three-dimensionality, and emergence of its own corresponding typologies. Hong Kong's resistance to becoming a car-dependent city is grounded in the city's unique geography and history, rooted in several factors. A fundamental aspect underlying Hong Kong's distinct form of urban development and high density is the limited land supply of uh, that began with the incremental ceding of territory to the British by the Chinese as a consequence of the Opium War in the 19th century, starting with um, Hong Kong Island in uh, uh, 1842. Um, here you can see the narrow strip of like er early development um, on the northern shore of the island, which did barely offer any land to conveniently build on. Another factor is land management. Britain had to make sure that Hong Kong was financially self-sufficient. As a port city and with restricted land for industry or agriculture, land itself became the means to generate income for the government. Up until today, all land in Hong Kong is owned by the government and the restricted number of new land lots per year is leased out to the highest bidding developers. As you can see here on this map, actually only about uh, 25% of, uh, of the territory is actually built up, the rest is uh, entirely clean and, and um, country parks mostly. The resulting enormous cost of land um, produces its own typologies, as building tall remains profitable even with a small building site, Hong Kong has generated the pencil tower with low floor area efficiency but high pedestrian accessibility through the small grain it produces in its footprint. The high land price also has an indirect but important impact on pedestrian ratio. The cost factor of owning a car is not so much the price of the car or the gasoline, but the price for the parking lot to accommodate the car. In early 2018, Hong Kong reported a record number of total registered cars of around 600,000 in the city, which still only corresponds to 82 cars per thousand people. This is less than a tenth of the U.S. Uh, a car ownership rate of 910 cars per, per thousand people. The combination of limited territory with tight land regulation and the introduction of high-density new towns, such as Sha Tin Xin here, uh, from the 1950s onward, created a city that is compact and dense throughout its region. There is no sprawl in the MTRC, the Mass Trans Railway uh, uh, 
um, Transit Railway Corporation plays a crucial role for urban development in Hong Kong and in particular for its development as a pedestrian city. The main source of income for the MTRC is not the train ridership but property development on the sites above and around the stations. As a developer, the MTRC creates high-density, mixed-use projects on top of its stations that integrate transport terminals with direct exchange to other modes, constituting Hong Kong's own model of transport-oriented development. Another factor, the extreme topography, especially on Hong Kong Island, uh, is uh, an important influence on the embodied experience of urban space. The cityscape along the northern shore of Hong Kong Island is characterized by stair streets that mediate between the topography and the buildings lined up alongside them. Hopewell Center in Wan Chai is one of the many examples on Hong Kong Island where the building itself becomes an escalating device. Both the notion of ground floor as well as front door lose their usefulness in a spatial situation that works in three dimensions and that celebrates multiplicity of connections. The pedestrian network is characterized by its three-dimensionality and the fact that it not only includes sidewalks on typical streets but also elevated walkways, MTR station tunnel, tunnels and passages through public and private buildings um, producing a unique form, uh, produces a unique form of navigation infrastructure through the city. Hong Kong Land was the first developer to start building footbridges between buildings by first connecting the Mandarin Hotel and the Princess Building in the mid-60s. Um, advantaged by its domination of land ownership in Central, you see everything that's green here is actually owned by Hong Kong Land. Um, Hong Kong Land was able to build its own connected mini-city in Hong Kong's business district. According to the high-risk department, there are more than 700 footbridges in Hong Kong today interwoven with uh, transport infrastructure and buildings and in conjunction with elevators and escalators they form a tight pedestrian network with minimized obstructions from cars or other obstacles. Today shopping malls form an integral part of this pedestrian system and the public domain in Hong Kong. Many of the large malls have passages that offer public access 24-7 and their impeccable cleanliness, curated sounds soundscape and most importantly conditioned air uh, offer an often welcome contrast to the noisy, polluted and steamy subtropical environment outside. <laughs> the resulting density of spatial variation, the density of functions and the density of cultural heritage that are produced by this environment and experienced by the passes through produce an intensity of experiences that could never be perceived by traveling in a car. For all these reasons, I argue that Hong Kong can be understood as a corporeal city. As a city of walking bodies, uh, Hong Kong has developed unique urban and architectural typologies and a particular urban culture that is characterized by high people density and its general acceptance. A certain sense of community, accessible and affordable multimodal mass transit and the condition of transitional spaces addressing all human senses. In the following I will present further aspects and typologies that characterize Hong Kong as a corporeal city, mostly drawing from three case studies of the districts of Central Taiwan and Hong Kong respectively. One particular aspect of walking in Hong Kong is the mechanization of pedestrian movement. Over time, Hong Kong has introduced mechanical devices to enhance and accelerate pedestrian movement. The 800 meter long sequence of the central mid-level escalator is the most iconic example. It was implemented in the 1980s to mitigate the extreme level change between Queen's Road Central um, and the residential cluster on the mid-levels. So this is the stretch starting from the central Escalators. Mechanization plays an important role in Hong Kong's pedestrian infrastructure. However, as opposed to motorized car travel, while engaging with them, the body stays autonomous. In fact, these mechanized devices are part of the urban landscape traversed. Also, they do not replace or disable the functions of the body, but rather support them.
In Hong Kong, the catchment area of the MTR station is substantial in terms of uh, population and programmatic comprehensiveness. Um, the notion of walking radius effectively captures the organization of entire neighborhoods, as I will demonstrate on the example of Taiwan here, like roughly something like five minutes and ten minutes radius around the, the station. Um, Taiwan is a former industrial area, with some of the industrial buildings being converted into galleries, uh, ateliers or lofts. Otherwise, it is mainly a residential area with a strong presence of public housing. Approximately 35,000 people, more or less the size of Charlottesville, live within the 400 meter or 5 minute walking radius of the station. So, like what, essentially like what, what we see here. Um, the pedestrian network that, that we see here uh, in this graphic is composed of individual connecting stretches, each of which is provided by either the MTRC, the highways department, the public housing authority, or a private developer. Uh, together, they form a resulting uh, a network that seamlessly links uh, residences, wet markets, retail, community services, childcare centers, and educational institutions. The compression of space and the high degree of pedestrian connectivity that is open to all independent of age and income levels fosters inclusiveness, uh, chance encounter, and overall uh, social health due to mutual perception and informal brief daily interactions. Pedestrian flow and small businesses mutually sustain each other. In Hong Kong, there is an entire ecology of different types of scales of retail, from the large global brand store to a small shop of the size of a shelf. This diversity of retail does not only provide opportunities to run uh, to, to people to run their own businesses, um, actually people from uh, different backgrounds and, and different levels of income, it also caters to all kinds of needs of walking passers-by, precisely in those places where these needs may emerge. The mobile street hawker with his cart selling snacks such as boiled eggs, steamed sweet potatoes and roast chestnut at the corner of the street. Um, and um, hawker stalls outside the MTR station in Central providing anything one could need upon exit from the underground from a new pantyhose to a 10 minute shoe repair, <laughs> a need that occurs quite frequently in a city whose residents take an average of 6,880 steps a day. The hawker stalls that are licensed by the Hong Kong government also contribute to the breaking down of perceived scales in Hong Kong streetscapes introducing small cells of activity, curiosity, and opportunity along the pedestrian path. Each district in Hong Kong has a municipal services building that caters to the needs of body and mind of its inhabitants. A wet market, a cooked food center, oftentimes also a library, and a gymnasium are conveniently stacked on top of each other, easily accessible to the community. Fagin Street Municipal Services Building in Wong Park uh, seen here is one of the more complex examples. The first two floors are dedicated to wet market, the third floor houses a cooked food center, on the fourth and fifth floors it's a public library including study rooms for students, floors 10 to 13 are rooms and halls for various sports activities, and floors 2 and 6 to 9 house district services and government offices. Fayuan Municipal Services Building uh, is located um, between the two MTR stations in Hong Kong, uh, here and here, um, served by different lines and connected to the pedestrian network both on the ground level as well as to the, the elevated walkway level. The typology of the municipal service building in Hong Kong is an incredible example of programmatic hybridization, adding short distances of access in the vertical direction in addition to the fine horizontal grain in this neighborhood. Um, according to recent data from Japan's Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare, Hong Kong now leads globally in life expectancy. This may be surprising given the tight living conditions, significant levels of pollution and the high stress level in its working population. The reasons for this uh, are manifold and many of them 
uh, can be considered as a general care for and attention to the body. They include high quality, affordability and accessibility of healthcare, the provision of public housing to half of its population, an understanding of nutrition in terms of medicine and the fact that all people in Hong Kong are fully integrated in the vitality of the city. Certainly included is the fact that Hong Kong people engage in intensive functional walking to manage their everyday lives. To, to uh, conclude, uh, Hong Kong may be suggestive of a different kind of uh, future city that is rooted in the very basic corporeal function of walking, despite its large size, number of people and complexity. Underlying this conceptual framework are the cultural dimensions of functional walking and the direct engagement with urban space, as well as the full unmediated kinesthetic experience uh, of the city. Thank you. Uh, I have question, so please. I'm very happy, particular since I grew up in Hong Kong. So. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Nanya. That, that was wonderful. Um, that was really interesting. I've never been to Hong Kong, but I, I kept thinking about Singapore. Yes. Can you contrast Hong Kong and Singapore along some of the axes that you were um, discussing? Well, I, I have to say that I, I know Hong Kong way better than I know Singapore. I've been to Singapore for like a four, 24 hour stopover, and then I, I lived in Hong Kong for five years. So, <laughs> so um, I, I think that, that uh, because of the reasons that I, I think uh, Singapore has a has uh, is is also like very very walkable in, in many levels. I think what's what's so unique about Hong Kong is this intense compression of space that that really um, uh, makes all those distances both horizontal and vertical even even shorter. Um, so so like the the amenities and. Like basically life support <laughs> and things you can find like within a very very short walking walking distance it's it's, it's really quite quite immense and also this um, uh, yeah what is interesting is I often think of it in terms of an ecology because there is you know like just the way how how economy works that they're kind of like really this large kind of like global brand stores but then but then but then there's also this kind of like small uh, hawker, street hawker, and then there are all the scales in between. So, so it's in a way that, that really can cater to a lot of different needs, but at the same time also provide uh, a lot of different ways of, of making a living somehow. So, so it's in a way that really like this, this type of diversity in, in the city as well. And I, I really am not in a good position to kind of make, <laughs> to, to, to Thank you so much. This is fascinating. Um, I just kept thinking about my experience of doing field work in Shanghai for a year. And I lived in a very old neighborhood in the southwest part of Shanghai. And a lot of my informants work in Pudong District, which is like built on the principles of Le Corbusier. And if, interestingly, whenever I go from where I live to where I interview my informants, is that the part the part where I lived is very walkable, and there is a lot of very narrow streets, and you know, like uh, peddlers and very um, uh, grocery stores, you know, everywhere, and that's very walkable. And I walk a lot, but when you get to the Pudong District part, you also walk a lot because you know, like the subway, it, the station is huge, and you have to walk ten minutes before you know transferring from one line to another. And then after you get out of that station, you have to spend, you have to spend like half an hour just walking from the station to wherever you are. But you, you you think that the building is really close. It's not. I mean, you walk a lot, but but it's not very really walkable. People complain about how confusing it is. So you you you. you you know, keep walking for 10 minutes and you realize, oh, that's a dead end. I have to go back all the way back and then walk, you know, all over for, for another 10 minutes. So I'm just interested because a lot of the walking in Hong Kong seems to be facilitated by the uh, machination, like the, the elevators and the shopping malls and, and all of that. And I wonder what's the difference between walking in that kind of environment and just simply walking on the street. And then this, like, what's the difference between streets that are, the, the, the environments that are walkable versus environments where you have to, you just have to walk a lot, but you don't really enjoy walking. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I think the, the, the first area in Shanghai that you mentioned is probably more like a traditional streetscape, right. like what we, what, we, what we think about when we think of walkable environments. Yeah. And, and, and the Pudong area is interesting because it actually shares many features with Hong Kong, and they actually uh, some Hong Kong developers who put exactly the same kind of development there as well, like there's IFC double tower in, in Hong Kong and now there's one in Shanghai as well and when you enter it's exactly the same with like signage and <laughs> the same shops. But um, but but the thing is that the the the, the road like Uh, like Hong Kong actually has the advantage of having started out as a as a different like in a, uh, like in, in the late nineteenth century when when the kind of like first grid was laid out that it was actually uh, created with relatively like, small plot sizes and still with kind of like walk, walkable sizes and uh, sort of like yeah with predominantly pedestrian pedestrian um, access. Um, but but the thing with Pudong is that it was really like laid out on, on a really empty piece of land and with a clear uh, priority for the car. And even though it has then footbridges laid over it, those footbridges are really like following the road. But in a way, they don't um, they don't really function in, in the way these kind of pedestrian networks function in Hong Kong, where where the networks they. Like there is a streetscape which you can also walk upon, but the networks they almost uh, work in the other direction, uh, uh, like crossing through buildings. So you actually like on a footbridge and then you walk through a hotel lobby and then you wouldn't on the footbridge and then you walk through a bank lobby and then you're on the footbridge. So 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 and that makes it very different from walking on the street, but then at the same time it, it becomes very like convenient. There is actually interestingly. Hong Kong discovered the, the, the issue of walkability only a few years ago. I mean, it's sort of. I mean, at the beginning, I mentioned that it, that it became this kind of pedestrian city almost by accident because of the many reasons I, I mentioned. But um, uh, yeah, the. The, the, now there is like more awareness and a lot of critical voices about the actual walkability. So, so the people in this group say that it is highly accessible but not walkable because they still sort of complain about like noise and pollution and on the street level is actually quite intense because of the density. But um, but I think another thing that is important is that when like your your sense of time when walking depends a lot what's happening along the way. Dong, you're like on that walkway that is completely not covered. You basically get roasted like a sausage on the grill while you're, <laughs> while you're like walking, and there's nothing that, that to look at for all that time. So all you're thinking about is like when you're gonna arrive at your destination. Well, well, when there's like a fine grain of things along that path where you can see things, and it's actually it's kind of distracting and entertaining, and you don't really know how much time you spend. Uh, as a Hong Konger, I do have to ask this question. And I think it gave, um, uh, uh, well actually, first of all, I learned a lot about my own city. And you, you demonstrated that the Hong Kong government, uh, often together with developers, really put a lot of thought into city planning, like the multi-use of a single building and so on and so forth. But I have to say that one of the casualty is uh, the culture side. The, the reason I say that is because of the high premiums of land. So uh, when we look at the uh, West Kowloon Art uh, District, it's just a total fiasco. Because a lot of people complain is that you know the land is very uh, expensive. So the people who are willing to invest in developing the art area are the developers, which uh, made a lot of Hong Kong people immediately suspicious of their intent. And uh, as a result, the first attempt was a total failure. So I wonder if you can comment on, on that. Yeah, <laughs> the West Kowloon Kowloon District is a whole whole topic in itself. Yeah, like, of course. Uh, <laughs> like the but, but the developers, I mean, I know, they're yeah. encroaching yeah. on art makes yeah. a lot of people really suspicious of that. Yeah, the 
Yeah, I think I mean the West Berlin Cultural District is a, is a, is quite a, an enterprise because it, like nowhere in the world there's such a thing to have like such a large piece of land that is also very poorly connected to the city to be developed it's into a, a cultural land, district right? from yeah. scratch. So, so that's that's why it's really like a particular particular case. But then I mean Hong Kong developers are definitely not used to uh, building uh, cultural cultural projects. Um, I mean, there is also an issue about like uh, new developments within the existing fabric and the culture of the existing fabrics, yeah, because um, at the, the West Berlin Cultural District is really created based on a sort of feeling of Hong Kong that it cannot compete with uh, cities like Be Beijing in, in, in Shanghai in terms of culture that it has like a lack that it needs to make up for it and and, and creating that, that thing from, from scratch but then at the same time there's a lot of living culture that it may not be confident enough to kind of like look at and cultivate in the hinterland that 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 also gets sometimes eaten up by new developments and then the problem of these new developments is that they typically take up a much larger piece of land and, and have a very different uh, approach to, to the streetscape and, and really um, yeah, introducing a new scale of grain that, that also kind of like works counter this, these kinds of qualities that it, that it actually has. So, so it's one thing, I mean the, the creating new cultural venues is a total novelty for them anyway, but then there's also a problem related to culture that, that relates to the existing fabric. That could be, it, it's fine, one can actually, it's, it's possible to, to have a large scale building, but if there was more awareness about the importance of, of this sort of like everyday culture, it could be, it could, like, there are architectural solutions to this like, that, that could make the developer happy, but still. Yeah. Okay, maybe one last question. Yes. Thanks. So the, the, the different types of works you just described. Um, is it possible that what is more pertinent to you cities is not the typology of transportation, but the typology of the interface that transportation provides people to interact with the environment? So is, is, there, is there a distinction between that two types, two typologies? So what, like the typology of the interface would like, you give an example? Like you just said, if there is just a tunnel and I have nothing to say, mm -hmm. I just want to walk and it makes this way. You know, you know what I mean, so. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that, that the way, like the, the, the way these things hybridize and, and like the, the more they start to interlock, I think the, the more interesting it, it becomes in a way like the, it, like, because you have a, maybe there is actually not, not much difference between a, a, a freeway for cars and, and that walkway in Fudong, right? It's just one is for cars and one is for pedestrians. But, but it's not just about this piece of infrastructure, it's also how it is actually embedded in its context and how it sort of like cuts through or interacts with its context. So, so it's very much about this interaction or interface. Of, 